Alright, what's happening, y'all? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores, and it is time. Let's break this all the way down. Eugene Shin is the catalyst for the future of Commander's greatness. I'm telling you right now, believe me, he is going to bring all of the analytics that we've been wishing for to the Commander's organization, especially on the field wise. Now, when it comes to like stadium stuff, that's more Jason Wright and those other guys. But when it comes to on the field decisions, as far as players we draft, players we get in free agency, whether we resign somebody or not, who we let go, how much we give a particular player that we do want and end up signing, who we prioritize in drafts, players or position wise a lot of that stuff and even in games do we go forward on fourth down um do we do when do we go forward on fourth down when are, when are the best times when does it make the most sense he's bringing all of that type of stuff so we're gonna do a a quick breakdown on his track record of elite team building in the nfl and winning everywhere he's been how much those teams have won how how much better off have they been since he got there versus before he got there also we're gonna do a full breakdown of his philosophy fees on how he builds teams some of the position groups he's prioritizes all of that type of stuff man and it's looking like a man maybe brock bowers to the washington commanders man as a georgia bulldog fan you know i would love nothing more than that it's not an automatic thing though we're going to talk about some of the things he says that that shows why we could end up getting brock bowers but some of the other things that says now nah, we may go elsewhere early in the first round i mean he even dives into whether he prefers to trade up or stay put in the draft or trade back i mean he gives like a full breakdown on the best way to build your team also he's already had an impact on this team and some decisions we've made already we're gonna dive into that and more but before we do make sure you still farm that like button still farm the subscription button and still farm the bell next to that subscription button so you get notification each and every time i release the formless of an opinionated video just like this one be on the lookout for constant uploads the channel is back to full power youtube is no longer tripping so y'all can contribute to the stream however you want to becoming a channel member that's back donating to the super chats during live streams or even to a video there's like a little dollar sign down there for you to donate that way or if you want to continue donating to the cash up at paypal either way i'm eternally grateful and i will make sure i try to thank everybody whenever i can even if you donate while i'm not live streaming the next video the next stream i do i'm gonna make sure i shout you out so man, i really appreciate y'all stay tuned for all of the content because i have so many interesting videos that i'm coming out with regarding the future the commanders mock drafts all that type of stuff so make sure you stay tuned and without further ado man sorry for the long intro let's get it he's our quarterback of the five ten years and i truly believe that first of all eugene shin who we hired like I think like late October, maybe early November. No, I think it was late October has already made an impact on this team. Like already has influenced decisions that we've made because Ron Rivera even said it himself. Eugene Shin helped the commanders make trade decisions by helping to explain the value of trades made. So if Eugene Shin is not here, maybe we don't trade Montez Sweat and or Chase Young. More than likely, not both of them. Eugene Shin came in and was like, man, I mean, I know you would love to keep your first round edge rushes and Chase Young especially has been really good this season, but the picks that you can get in return and what we can do with those picks, man, I, it may be a little bit more valuable. That's the type of thinking that Eugene Shin has already given to Josh Harris's new team because I'm just going to call this Josh Harris's team until we get a new GM and a new head coach and stuff like that. And um, he had an impact on those Chase Young and Montez Sweat trades. I'm not automatically saying that without him here, those trades don't happen. But Eugene Shin definitely contributed to that because I'm sure Ron Rivera is still trying to be in win-now mode and all of that. Probably preferred not to get rid of those guys. But but, I mean, there's also a lot of different factors to it because, of course, we were looking like, I don't not even sure if we can pay the guys the money that they want. You saw the contract Montez Sweat got from the, the, the Bears long term. I don't think we were willing to do that. So they were probably going to end up walking in free agency anyway. After this season, we probably gonna weren't going to be able to retain, first of all, both of them, maybe not either of them. And so Eugene Shin basically broke it down. Hey, man, 
even if we could potentially resign these guys it may not be worth it just go ahead and trade these guys go ahead and get that headache off of you off of your mind for now get that stress off of you keep it pushing also Ron Rivera said back on November 1st that Eugene Shin is already contributing to a lot of the analytical things that they've been doing Rivera said on November 1st that looking at the analytics this was after Eugene Shin was hired that a lot of the analytics are pointing positively for Sam Howell right now and his potential to be a franchise quarterback for this organization. So does that mean that Eugene Shin likes Sam Howell just simply because his analytics say that? Also, we got to think about the fact that this was said on November 1st. You know, Sam Howell hasn't necessarily had his best games recently these past couple of weeks. I'm not going to blame these losses on him at all. And I still, Rico Street Scores feels like Sam Howell can definitely be a franchise quarterback for us. Y'all know I'm Mr. Trade Up for franchise quarterback. I've been that for years on years debating 1v100 in the crowd swinging like no I don't care what y'all are talking about we need to draft a quarterback now we need to do whatever it takes you need to trade up packing some picks together to get a franchise I, I've been that guy for years a lot of people felt like no we could just rely on elite defense all this type of stuff I've been saying draft quarterback but now I'm even like nah we don't necessarily need to tra draft a quarterback high in my opinion I feel like Sam Howell can be that guy and again Eugene Shin's analytics are showing that um, Rivera said this too and I you know you don't really hear Rivera talk about analytics so I'm like 99% sure this came from Eugene Shin because this all happened November 1st as well like the, um, Ron Rivera talked about Eugene Shin helping uh, influence the decisions to trade away Montez Sweat and Chase Young and him saying that the analytics shows positively for Sam Howell being a franchise quarterback all of that went down on the same November 1st press conference so Eugene Shin is already having an impact on this team now let's go back and, and, and analyze why we feel like the commanders needed a Eugene Shin well there was an article that came out I believe on ESPN and they did something to where like which NFL team is the least analytically advanced and the commanders and Titans ranked somewhere in like the lowest the exact quote is that Tennessee the Tennessee and Washington have small analytics groups just one staffer each to the best of my knowledge and their work isn't well known to their peers it, 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 that's a negative indicator it doesn't rule out heavier quantitative involvement that isn't known to the outside. But when asked which teams are further behind from the data analytics standpoints, those two teams are consistently brought up amongst league circles. So basically, between the Titans and the Commanders, we're the furthest behind in analytics out of the entire NFL. Which is really interesting because now with Eugene Shin, we're projected to probably end up being one of the ones in the front. We're going to go from one of the ones in the back to one of the ones in the front. We're going to do a big skip. Um, also, before we dive into Eugene Shin's philosophies and all of that type of stuff, the real like majority of this video, why a lot of y'all are here and stuff like that, just to do a quick breakdown of who he is and where he came from. Shin has worked for several NFL teams in the past. Shouts out to Hogshaven for this article right here, both on the coaching and personnel analytics side of the house, including Baltimore. Miami and Jacksonville. He started out with the Ravens focused on coaching analytics, essentially helping to make decisions about fourth down plays, two point conversions, challenging decisions, among other things. In Miami, he focused on personnel analytics, assessing college players as potential draft picks and evaluating free agent options for the team, as well as contract structuring. In Jacksonville, and as in Washington, he was charged with overseeing all football analytics operations. Shin was in global finance before making the shift to football analytics full time in 2014. So this is a guy with a business background. But basically in Baltimore, he was helping them on the coaching side. In Miami, he was helping them on the team building side. With the Jaguars, he did both. And then that's assumed to be what he's going to be doing for the commanders, both. So when it comes to, do you go for it on fourth down? Do you do two point conversions? Do you challenge that? Do you throw the challenge flag for that? All that type of stuff on one side, the coaching side, and also personnel side. Who do you draft? Who do you prioritize a free agency? Who do you want to re sign that's an unrestricted free agent for the commanders currently going into the 2024 offseason? Um, even the guys that you do end up signing, how do you structure those contracts? How much mon money are you willing to give? how much guaranteed money how many incentives over the course of how many years are we doing boy years stuff like that he's going to play a huge role in all of that and i'm very excited just off of the fact look at his track record baltimore ravens miami dolphins and jacksonville jaguars all great to elite teams right now in the nfl all teams way better than us and you can easily say that jacksonville 
was behind us at a certain point in time when Ron Rivera first got here Jacksonville was even probably even more of a laughing stock than we were and look how they surpassed us and became a great team it's led by them drafting Trevor Lawrence of course but it's not just Trevor Lawrence shouts out to Eugene Shin for helping to contribute to the, both of those teams becoming the great to elite teams that they are and I'm very excited about what he could do for the commanders now First of all, before we dive into how Shin works, how he builds teams and stuff like that, how he makes his decisions, the coaching side, the personnel side, all that type of stuff. Some interesting statements that he made in his video breakdown. He's like doing a presentation to Florida Atlantic. Um, he like says a few interesting things. First of all, in general, older coaches don't buy into analytics and the younger coaches do. I feel like that's pretty obvious, but the fact that he pointed it out and this is a guy that's in analytics, he's in the trenches when it comes to football operations around the NFL analytics and stuff like that. So now it's like pretty much 100% confirmed that this is a real trend. The younger coaches are willing to do that. The older coaches are not. So that also shows that the commanders are more than likely with Josh Harris preaching analytics for almost a year now since he's bought the team even before Eugene Shin got here and then you bring in Eugene Shin who's one of the top analytics guys in sports all of sports not even just football by itself um it sounds like we're more than likely going to lean towards a younger coach that's willing to listen to the analytics more than what an older coach would do so we'll see how that goes but it's quite likely that our next head coach is on the younger side rather than the older side just simply because of that because they're prioritizing analytics above all else probably um he also stated the analytics is practically dictating almost every move for most baseball teams he says the, also that basketball is probably next in line and catching up to baseball and then that football is the furthest behind and the thing that i took away from this the part that had me excited the part that makes me the happiest to hear that is that it sounds like we're probably going to be further ahead than most nfl teams then like if the nfl is behind and we're one of the teams that's doing it that sounds like we're going to be one of the teams in front of things and probably one of the more the better, better built, smarter decision making teams in the NFL. Again, on the coaching side and personnel team building side, as far as players that you bring into the organization. Again, look at the Dolphins, look at the Ravens, look at the Jaguars. He led those operations as far as decision making goes. And then just look at them and then look at us all you need to say so that's another reason i think rivera is gone as well because everything eugene shin stands for with analytics and being very aggressive on fourth downs we'll get to that later is literally the uh, direct antithesis to what ron rivera feels and thinks or what he actually does i mean he's supposed to be riverboat ron he's supposed to be this aggressive guy he has not been that for us especially not this year so i just can't even see them coinciding peacefully like coming to a mutual decision where both are happy it just so i already think ron rivera already gone uh, you know according to a lot of reports close to josh harris and stuff like that I already did a video on that days ago um but that in itself is just like yeah that's not gonna work eugene shin and ron rivera would never be able to get along and come to mutual decisions to make both of them happy so moving on now let's talk about how shin works first of all he doesn't watch a lot of film because that's not his area of expertise he can admit he relies on scouts to be his eyes and he does all of the mathematics statistical analytics stuff and i mean when you hear that you're like well it would be nice if you could do both but no i want him to stay focused on what he's doing because again it worked for the dolphins it worked for the ravens and it worked for the jaguars keep doing what you're doing please next point there is generally an analytics guy in the booth for teams during games um so i'm really interested in seeing how if he ends up being that guy like if he's in the booth during games and stuff like that and, you know and they do that so that they can be really quick with things like he's up there with if our, if our offensive coordinator is in the booth upstairs he'll he'll probably be up there with them or at least have a guy that's up there with them even if he isn't personally we're gonna have an analytics guy up there with the offensive coordinator and a lot of decisions will be made analytics based and stuff like that during games um also really interesting his analytics models are determined pre-game and they lack the ability to modify the models in game for any random unpredictable factors like injuries they come in with a certain model that they that they prepare before the game happens and you know there's they can't really modify make major changes to that model they kind of just stick with it even if there's like an unpredictable injury or something that happens um but I mean, at the very least, when he had this presentation two years ago, 
presenting it to Florida Atlantic's business school. Um, that's when he said this. I don't know within the past two years, maybe he's figured out a way to where he can modify those models. But based off of what we know from two years ago when he presented this information to the public, um, that's where we are right now. So I'm just going to assume moving forward, unless he says otherwise, that he doesn't have the ability to modify his model mid-game based on unpredictable factors like injuries. Also, Shin created a fourth down decision-making model for the Ravens that was so successful and consistent that the Ravens kept using it even after he left the organization. They were like, thank you, Shin. I know you're on to off to bigger and better things because, again, for the Dolphins, he was on the coaching side. For the Ravens, he was on the personnel side. So going to the Jaguars and doing both was technically a promotion. I don't think the Ravens wanted him to go. I don't think they fired him anything. He was just like, I'm going to go take this promotion. And the Ravens were probably sad to lose him. But they held on to those fourth down decision-making models that he came up with. Um, so that's another account and testament to how great great of an analytics guy that he is that even after he was gone even after the ravens brought in new guys they were like hey i know you want to have control over stuff but this is working don't fix what's not broken eugene shin gave this us as a parting gift do not change it it's working please don't mess it up um now let's move on to how eugene shin builds his teams and what he prioritizes as far as team building position groups all of that type of stuff um and this is probably the majority of the reason why a lot of y'all are here so no more stalling let's get to it First of all, let's start with running backs because that's always a point of debate. Do running backs matter to Eugene Shin? In short terms, kind of, but not really. Like running backs matter to him, but not necessarily the run game. Like there is data that shows on average the winning team outrushes the losing team by almost eight attempts per game. However, through the first three quarters of the game, the number of rushing attempts is almost equal with the winning team averaging only two more. But when you get to the fourth quarter, the winning team is averaging 5.6 more rushing attempts than the losing team. So, of course, this could be viewed two different ways. Either winning teams are already winning in the fourth quarter, thus rush the ball more to run the clock and avoid any mistakes or teams who don't get past um, happy in the fourth quarter win because they stick to the run and the run led to the victory basically he then subsequently shows that teams with larger leads going into the fourth quarter have more rushing attempts it's the winning that leads to the rushing not the other way around so basically all of that is to say eugene shin feels like passing the ball well is a priority first and foremost and then the run game should open up after that after you scare defenses with your passing game and now the defense has to take people out of the box which allows you to run the ball a little bit easier and more efficiently so this is the very antithesis to traditional football thinking of establishing the run game first and then get the passing game going afterwards usually off of like some type of play action or something like that no he's like we're gonna pass 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 and then off of that, we should be able to run the ball once defense is afraid of our passing game, which is really interesting. Um, that's one of those things where it's still like, I mean, I hope that works out. I'm very excited about that. But that's probably the one, the one point that he brought up throughout all of this that we're going to talk about in this video that I'm like the least sure of. I'm excited. I hope we become that way because this is a pass happy league. This is a passing led league team league. And I've been saying that for years, which is why I was screaming. We need to do whatever it takes to get an elite quarterback. I don't care what it takes. While everybody else was saying prioritize other positions. I've been screaming for years. Do whatever it takes to get your franchise guy. And I'm still even the guy that feels like Sam Howell could potentially be a franchise quarterback. I really do. But my point is, this is a pass happy league. And one of my biggest points that I was bringing up when I was debating against people that we need to prioritize quarterback above all else. And T Taylor Heineke is not good enough. Alex Smith's not good enough. All these little band-aids we could put on the team is not good enough. We need to get our Trevor Lawrence. We need to get our Tua Tagovailoa stuff like that. One of the main points I was bringing up is that this is literally a pass happy league this is a passing league and it's by design it's not just because we have elite quarterbacks and you could argue this is like a golden age of quarterbacks it's not just that the nfl is literally set up for offenses to be better than defenses literally just by the rule book just by the way it's refereed everything the way the game is dictated the flow of the game is literally set up for offense to beat defense a good throw to a good receiver is always going to beat great coverage by a great defense 
every, almost every time, more times than not by far. That's just the way the game is set up. It's the same way with basketball. No matter how of an elite defender you are, Kawhi Leonard, anybody, Paul George, you, you're not going to do nothing with KD. KD wants to drop 30, he's dropping 30. It doesn't matter. Football is kind of pretty much the same way, but it's more so rule-based than just simply the floor of the game. It's the floor of the game as well, but it's rule-based because just think of it from Roger Goodell's po point of view or the NFL owner's point of view. The more offense, the more points, the more views, the more money. It's literally set up for quarterbacks. That's why quarterbacks are marketed more. Uh, you can argue even the way like games feel rigged and it feels like the script always favors the teams with the more exciting offenses and and the better quarterbacks i mean whatever way you want to look at it that's why eugene shin is heavy into pass 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 and run whenever it makes sense after all of that uh, moving on to the next point also as far as running backs goes he prefers to draft them high so that's why it's like he doesn't necessarily devalue running backs. He just devalues running the ball just in general. Um, he prefer to draft them high over overpaying for them in free agency. He feels like they are vastly overvalued in free agency. He feels like the money that running backs get in free agency is just absolutely ridiculous. But again, this interview happened a couple of years ago. And since then, running backs are starting to make less money. Saquon Barkley had to take that ugly little cheap one year deal that he was clearly worth more than. But right now, the running back, I mean, the running backs even had like a group chat where they were supposed to be in solidarity and just all boycott NFL contracts until the value of running backs go up higher. And then everybody just started folding left and right and that that just ended up not working out um but still as of two years ago when he said this he just feels like running backs don't deserve a lot of money just when in doubt when a running back is ready to get out of their rookie contract into their next big contract their big long-term contract um he just feels like hey forget it just draft the running back high and he feels like kind of like how the lions felt with jameer gibbs um, where everybody was like, why would you take a running back that high? Um, now look how it's paying off for them. Look how good they are and how much he's contributing there. He's like, hey, man, if people want to let an elite running back that would have easily have gone top five in the draft like eight years ago slip to like pick 20, but everybody else is screaming, don't take a running back in the first round. He's like, I'll take a running back in the first round, basically. He's like, y'all sleep, man. I'll take these rookies. These, the, I'll draft my running backs over paying veteran guys any day with, with miles on them and stuff like that having so many carries being beat up just a bad run away from being hurt and just completely not being worth the contract never the same again i love my georgia bulldogs but todd todd Gurley and, and zeke elliott um are some of the guys that probably messed it up for future running backs for a while um getting big contracts like they probably deserve moving on to the next point but does eugene smith I mean, you, my fault. Eugene Shin like going forward on fourth down. I know a lot of y'all are very curious about this. In short answer form, yes. Big time, especially in the red zone. He prefers to be aggressive, but also in situations where it would end up being like a long field goal rather than taking like a long 50 yarder, 60 yarder. He's like, we're going for it. We're not putting it. We're going for it. I don't care. We could try to attempt, yeah, attempt to put to pin the team within their own like 15, 10 yard line. Yeah, that's, no, we're going for it. Unless it's just like fourth and long, but he's willing to gamble a lot. We're going to be a very aggressive team under Eugene Shen and his analytical model. So I know a lot of y'all are probably excited about that i know i am because if you have a talented enough team to where even if you mess up on fourth downs you have a defense that can get you the ball back you trust them and an offense to where even if you fail on fourth down you know that next possession they're going to come down and score seven anyway the confidence that their that fan bases have in the chiefs the the the, the um, chiefs fans have in patrick mahomes that that Jaguars fans having Trevor Lawrence and their offense or or the, the Ravens fans having Lamar Jackson and their offense you know these elite offenses with elite quarterbacks their fan bases are like yeah go ahead and go for fourth down I'm not worried about it because when in doubt even if we fail we could just come back and get it right back again and that's probably how Eugene Shin feels the, the way Dolphins fans feel about going for fourth down with Tua um, Eagles with the with the Jalen Hurts Bills with with Josh Allen you know hopefully we can get a situation like that going with Sam Howell um, so I'm really intrigued by that especially since his data said as of november 1st again we got to go back a little while that sam howe seems like he could be a franchise quarterback for us we'll see though also draft movement wise does he prefer to trade up stay put where he is or trade down in drafts i know a lot of y'all are very intrigued by this i know this is one of the biggest ones that i was super intrigued by i was like i gotta know that answer and basically to put it short he believes two lower picks is better than one higher higher one so he does like to trade down. So say we end up right now, we have the fifth overall pick. Let's say 
by the time the draft comes, we have like the fourth or third pick. I think it's highly likely that we trade back, especially if they feel like Sam Howell is the franchise quarterback. Best case scenario, Sam Howell is the franchise quarterback, and you can use all of that draft capital to build around him and to get this defense back to where it should be. Um, and so he feels he, – I just – I think more than likely if we have like a top five pick, which seems very likely because I don't see another win on the schedule. Uh, maybe the Cowboys, if if <laughs> if they uh, already have that their playoff seating solidified and they're just that they're just going to rest their starters. And even I just we better not win that meaningless game just to go back a draft pick that that, that ain't worth that type of pride to mess up our potential future. I will prefer to get the higher draft pick. So I feel like if we end up with a top five draft pick. We are very likely to trade down, especially because of Eugene Shin, and on top of that, if they feel like Sam Howell's a franchise quarterback, we could just trade back and get an, an elite player at, later on, like somewhere in the teens. And I'm working on a bunch of trade back scenarios potentially when I want to do my mock draft and stuff like that. Um, so to actually see like what's a realistic trade back. If we would go from five to 15, what could we get in return and stuff like that? So stay tuned for that as well. Moving on, how does he feel about tight ends? And as you can see in the title and what I said in the intro, this is a position that most teams struggle finding a franchise type of guy for, right? Well, Shin feels like tight end is the most undervalued position in football. And he mostly referenced how little money they make compared to wide receivers. So he's not even just talking draft. He's just talking in general. Elite tight ends are basically making around half of what elite receivers make. But they also do like double the work. They receive and block. Like Travis Kelsey does what a top receiver in the NFL does and also blocks, which top receivers don't usually do. It's crazy. He also emphasized that tight ends do the best job of disguising runner pass. As long as you have a dual threat guy, he feels like that's one of the biggest advantages an offense can have. He feels like having a dual threat tight end that hides run pass and keeps defenses on their toes all the time is a huge priority for building a team the right way to be successful and all of that. So does that automatically mean that he would be willing to take Brock Bowers very high in the draft? Not necessarily, especially since the previous point we just talked about, he feels like two lower picks is better than one high one. So maybe instead of taking Brock Bowers high, you trade back and end up getting one of the second, third, or fourth best tight ends in this draft that could potentially be a dual threat guy later in the draft. But I, you know, me as a Georgia Bulldog fan, I'm biased. I hope we end up getting Brock Bowers one way or another. Um, moving on. How about quarterback? Well, he literally said exact quote. Obviously, by far, the quarterback position is the most important position in football. I'm glad to hear that. That directly aligns with his pass happy offense leads to successful teams philosophy. Um, so there's that. And again, I've been screaming that at Commanders fans for years, going back and forth with people that truly didn't believe that was true. Now look at it. People kept talking about having an elite defense. Now look at the NFL being ran by great to elite quarterbacks. It doesn't even feel like there's e e even elite defenses left at this point. It feels like elite defenses get 30 dropped on their head whenever they face an elite quarterback anyway at this point. Now, granted, when we get to the playoffs, it's colder weather, all of that type of stuff. Defenses will matter a little bit more. But this league is ran by top quarterbacks, point blank, period. And then lastly, also an additional note, I love how easily he broke down the information to where even somebody like me, who I do consider myself somebody smart, but I don't make millions of dollars to understand this stuff. And he broke it down to where I understood this stuff almost perfectly. I felt like I understood it so well. So I'm, my extra note from this whole thing with his presentation to Florida Atlantic, the fact that he can break it down that well for college kids or somebody like me to be able to easily break uh, understanding all of that type of stuff. If he could break it down to us, imagine what he does for coaches scouts and players everybody that matters and impacts winnings and and how they how they need to understand things if he can break it down that well for us imagine how easily he could do it for the guys that actually matter for the burgundy and gold and impact the winning on the field so i'm super excited about this guy not only do i love his philosophies as far as coaching decisions in-game decisions and also how he builds prefers to build a team draft for agency whatever um far as far as players to get how you get them stuff like that how much you prioritize them but on top of all of that he does a great job of explaining that to everybody so everybody should be on one page we shouldn't have any problems i'm pretty sure him and josh harris are already locked in like this and i'm pretty sure whatever head coach or gm they end up hiring them I'm, I'm pretty sure eugene shin is going to be a part of that hiring process whoever they end up bringing in i'm pretty sure they're all going to be locked in and they're going to be on point they're going to be on the same wavelength and everything i'm super excited now just to go ahead and let y'all know the whole brock bowers point um 
again, my whole point is there's not another Brock Bowers, in my opinion. I, I really don't think so. I, I think he's a generational guy. There hasn't been a Brock Bowers in years past. There won't be another one for years. I think he immediately becomes, is him and Travis Kelsey the best tight end? If I think he's that great. And then my argument against O-line is, first of all, I love Olufashanu. I love Joe. Oh, I love a lot of these offensive linemen here. My boy Amarius Mims for Georgia has the highest ceiling I've seen from an, an offensive tackle coming out of the draft in years, even more than a higher ceiling than Darnell Wright and Dewan Jones. I love all of those guys, and that's my point. You, there's only one Brock Bowers, but there's several tackles I like. So if you could somehow take Brock Bowers early in the first, package some of those second, third round picks to trade up into the first round, a late first round, and get an elite tackle, you end up both. I feel like that's best case scenario. But of course, the safest bet is to just go ahead and take that elite tackle and then figure out tight end later. Um, but we'll see. But I'm telling you now, if if somehow Josh Harris and Eugene Shin decide to promote Eric Bieniemy to head coach. For this team instead of going to get like a ben johnson or somebody that i would really like um i think brock bowers is pretty much destined to come here because eugene shin prioritizes tight ends eric Bieniemy, the only time he's had consistent success over the course of an entire season i mean granted he had pat mahomes and andy reed there to help him and tyreek hill there for a little while as, as well but that offense was travis kelsey ran and so again with brock bowers potentially being the next travis kelsey with you can even argue probably a higher ceiling it's really crazy i mean just to put it in perspective brock bowers at a certain point in the season when he was out for three weeks he hadn't played a game in three weeks he was still first in power five tight ends in receptions with 41 and yards with 570 midway through the season after missing three weeks of football like that it's just they just don't make them like this dog they really don't and on top of all of that He's a guy that you can literally center an offense around. Like, I mean, that's that's when we're talking about a pass catching tight end. You can literally design the offense around a Brock Bowers. But on top of all of that, he blocks very well. He's that dual threat tight end that Eugene Shin apparently salivates over. Um, people always bring up first round tight ends like Kyle Pitts and Evan Ingram and stuff like that, how they didn't end up being worth their first round picks. But first of all, neither of those tight ends can block. But also, I just feel like it's more so for their cases, um, a bigger issue of not being used properly and or injuries, especially in Evan Ingram's situation um, with injury. So I don't think Brock Bowers will have an injury situation. I don't think he'll have a, a problem with the uh, offensive coordinator learning how to use him. I'm not worried about that at all. I'm, I'm really not at all. Um, so, again, even if we don't take Brock Bowers, I guess you can look at it this way. Say we do go tackle in the, in the first round instead of Brock Bowers. The, the other way that you could do it is that you could take tackle in the first round and then get a tight end in within one of those other picks we have in the first three rounds. One of the day one, day two, whatever. Because we have five top 100 picks, three top 50 picks. Um, you could probably find one of those other good tight end options because there they are. If you want to go tackle in the first round that's very understandable and also very likely if they just that's the safest route the safest route is tackle the gambling route for best case scenario the highest ceiling is to take brock bowers and then try to take a risk and see if you can end up still getting the elite tackle later in the first round somewhere in the middle trade up from the second whatever um but even though jaheem bell from florida state doesn't necessarily seem like the dual threat tight end that has the ability to block you have other options jatavion sanders from texas i mean you could you would argue he would be the best tight end in another draft class but this one just has the brock bowers the generational talent so we would probably be lucky to say you take tackle in the first round and get jatavion sanders in the second with that Bears high second round pick potentially, or even ours, our draft pick may end up being higher than the Bears. We'll see how that goes. You have Cade Stover, AJ Burner. You have options at tight end. And then also, just to go back to quarterback for a little bit before we get up out of here, if Eugene Shin and or the next GM and head coach pairing just for some reason doesn't like Sam Howell, just, I mean, some crazy way, Sam Howell just completely lays an egg the remainder of the season. Just go out there and just complete man. Um which qbs could you end up prioritizing targeting again i would hope sam howell's the franchise quarterback that's your best case scenario because then you use all those draft picks on building around them rather than taking a quarterback and then having less draft picks to build around that quarterback because you spent that draft pick on quarterback where you could have gotten a tackle or a brock bowers for that quarterback to throw to um but either way if for some reason sam howell just ends up not being the guy in eugene shin's eyes or the next head coach or gm 
it, it's really interesting what quarterbacks we may be able to get because you may not even necessarily have to have a top three pick to get a franchise quarterback like Caleb Williams and Drake may may be out of reach like at with like the fourth or fifth overall pick but you still have Bo Nix, Jaden Daniels who I feel like is extremely slept on Michael Penix Jr. Um, we have a, there's options out there so this is going to be really interesting seeing how this draft strategy shapes up but of course us hiring a new GM and a new head coach new defensive coordinator is going to change a lot of things but I'm very excited about how Eugene Shin wants to build this team and run this team because I'm very optimistic with him I was already pretty optimistic about the Burgundy and Gold's future 2024 and beyond but having a guy like Eugene Shin in the building and with as much power as he's going to have and how directly aligned he already is with Josh Harris and hopefully his ideals are directly aligned and parallel with the next head coach of GM I'm super optimistic about how great we can be because we're going to go from one of the worst analytics programs in the NFL to one of the best one of the leaders in it I'm super excited man but yeah man that's the end of this video. Please get in the comment section. Let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video. Are you just as happy and optimistic about us signing, bringing in Eugene Shin to be our top analytics guy? Let me know in the comment section how you feel about everything about him. First of all, do you just like him in general? And also specific points about his coaching philosophies and decision making. And also how he prefers to build a team. Would he prioritize his position group wise and all of that type of stuff and free agency, um, all of that type of stuff. So let me know exactly how you feel about everything I discussed in this video. And of course, don't leave this video without making sure you stiff arm that like button, stiff arm the subscription button if you're not subscribed yet, and hit that bell next to the subscription button. Even if you are subscribed, make sure you hit that so you get a notification each and every time I release these informative and opinionated videos because YouTube will not send you a notification every time you release a video, especially immediately, unless you have that bell pressed in. You may get a notification for this video that you're seeing today. Um, for example, like three days later, that that if you don't have that bell next next to the subscription button, stiff arm, you're just not gonna get the notifications the way that you're supposed to. So make sure you do that, and of course, also support the channel if you can, however you can. I'd really appreciate it because we're trying to get back onto the on on our feet after YouTube was tripping for a few months. We are back in full power. So yeah, man, I really appreciate y'all. Um, shouts out to all of my channel members. If you're not a channel member, go become one. Um, especially a pro bowl sponsor like the names you saw earlier. And man, I, without further do man super excited stay tuned for all of the daily uploads i'm gonna catch y'all later i'm out